All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so sorry, today we're doing another asynchronous lesson. Um, in today's lesson, we're going to do quite a good topic, which is uh, about how to write poetry in English. Uh, if you're an asynchronous group, uh, there's two pieces of homework, uh, which you can see in your classroom. Um, the first one is to do the quiz as usual. Uh, and the second piece of homework is I would like you to write a little piece of poetry, just two lines. And I want you to tell me what kind of rhythm you have used in your poem. So first, let's think about what kind of poems you've read in English. If you've read Charlie in the Chocolate Factory, there was a little poem inside there um, for the Oompa Loompa songs. The most important thing we've learned as far as children are concerned is never, never, never let them near your television set or better yet, just don't install the idiotic thing at all. You also know a very famous English language poet, probably the most famous writer in all of English language. Shakespeare, of course. Um, Shakespeare's most famous poems are his sonnets. Like, shall I compare thee to a summer's day that are more lovely and more temperate? Or my favourite one that I showed you in that Shakespeare lesson, um, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediment. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, nor when it bends with the remover to remove. Now, these are quite famous poems. We studied a middle English poet before. If you remember Geoffrey Chaucer. He's a poet as well. OK, so he wrote quite a lot of prose. Uh, but a lot of his book is written in poetry as well. So today I'm going to introduce to you a few more famous English poets, uh, and also we're going to learn some vocabulary for talking about poems. So um, let's start with what a poem is and how to describe some features of the genre of poetry. Um, here you can see two pieces of text. Um, one of them is a lovely poem uh, by William Blake. And the other one is, well, I took the poem and I translated it into regular English. Um, I want you to read them both, maybe pause the video and try to tell me which one is a poem and which one is not and why as well. So, OK, pause the video uh, and then read and then come back. OK, so it's pretty clear that the poem is B. And A is just a normal piece of text, maybe a descriptive text in a fiction story. Um, so how do we know? <clears throat> well, poetry uh, has a few features which are unique to poems. Um, and to find out the names of these features, well, I've done you some anagrams. Maybe you can try and solve them by yourself. An anagram is where you take the word, the letters of the word, and you mix them up. Uh, so example, for example, the first word, this word means uh, using words that have all the same endings. For example, uh, in the poem, there was trill, still, thrill. Or another example of this is uh, hat, mat, cat. They all have the same ending, these words. So how do you call that? Solve the anagram? No, it's rhyme, R-H-Y-M-E. Words with the same ending. What about the second one? This word means the beat of the poem. This one is rhythm. What else does a poem usually have? Well, this word here, it means saying the same thing again and again. For example, when you sing a song, there's often one part of the song that they sing once and then they sing it again and then they sing it again, right? It's called the chorus. So what is this noun? for saying something again and again. The verb is to repeat. The noun is repetition. I can't spell repetition. Um, OK, uh, the next word almost certainly you don't know, uh, but I'll explain it first anyway. Uh, this means taking a long phrase or a long idea and saying it in a short way. So. I don't have to explain some concept or explain some image. I just say it in short and your brain is the thing that's doing all the imagining of this image or idea. The adjective is succinct. The noun is succinctness. There you go. So a poem usually uses succinct ideas, which then make you think about the rest of the idea. Uh, the last one, 
This is the specific kinds of words that you see in poems. Yeah. This word here, from literature, you've got to make an adjective. Literature, the adjective is literary. And the second word is vocabulary. In English, usually when we teach you new words, we tell you formal and informal, right? Sometimes also we tell you archaic, which means old kinds of words that you don't see today anymore. Um, but literary vocabulary is a category by itself. Literary vocabulary is, well, words that you could use very easily in a poem and everyone understands what you mean, but if you said it in real life, people would think you're a bit strange and maybe showing off. Um, so let's find some examples of these. We'll go back to this uh, bird trapped in a cage. And uh, I would like you to just pause the video for me uh, and find examples of each of these things inside a text. Okay, so pause. All right, we're back, I suppose. Uh, so the rhyming words in this text are trill, still, hill. These words all rhyme. Usually the rhyming word, it comes at the end of each line of the poem, right? What about repetition? <clears throat> well, throughout the poem, the author is repeating, the caged bird sings, the caged bird sings. Um, why is he doing this? Well, I think the idea is that the bird is having a terrible life, but he keeps singing, he keeps singing, he keeps singing. Um, so he's repeating the caged bird sings. What about succinctness? In the poem, he says, the bird sings about things unknown. Well, what are things unknown? It's things that the bird doesn't really know about, but he's imagining um, because he's trapped in a cage, so he's never seen them before. But he doesn't say that. He just says things unknown. So it's uh, saying a long idea, but in a short way. And then you can fill in the rest of the idea by yourself. Now, what about literary vocabulary? Uh, well, there's quite a lot of examples here. Uh, for example, fearful means scary. Uh, we have to long for something, which means to want something. Um, and we also have the word distant. Uh, distant means far away. Um, there's also a few other ones. For example, the bird is singing of freedom. Sing of is not really very good for grammar, is it? What's What should it be? It should be sing about. But sing about doesn't really work in the line. Ready? For the caged bird sings about freedom. Something's gone wrong then with the rhythm of the line. Because the rhythm of the line goes da, 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 da. It has a very strict meter. Uh, and if you count the number of syllables on each line, the caged bird sings with a fearful trill. You get nine, eight, nine, eight. Um, so this poem, it gives examples of all of these poetic features. Of course, not every poem has got to have all of these in order to be a poem. Um, the modern kind of poetry style, it doesn't have any rhyme or even any rhythm. Um, but still it's considered to be a poem because it's succinct, uh, it's repetitive, and it uses literary vocabulary. If you want to write a poem that has no rhyme but still strong rhythm, then, you know, you're writing like Shakespeare used to when he was writing in his plays. Or if you want to write a poem that has rhyme but maybe no strict rhythm, maybe you're writing in the battle rap style. Uh, battle rap is always rhyming at the end of lines, uh, but for rhythm, you know, it's more about uh, the number of stressed syllables. It's not about the number of syllables in each line. Um, so different styles of poetry can be different things, but this is in general what poetry should have. OK, uh, so for English poetry, which one is the most important of all of these? Well, definitely the rhythm. Uh, English's poetry style is English language almost is unique because of how the rhythm in English works. Um, the poems of Shakespeare could never be written in French because of the way that English, 
rhythm works in vocabulary and doesn't work the same way as it does in French. So let's talk about how to describe rhythm in English. Uh, we did talk about describing rhythm when we talked about Shakespeare, but that was six months ago for you, I think. So um, let's try and remember. When we talked about Shakespeare's writing, we said Shakespeare used to write mainly in this one rhythm. The first word started with I and the second one with P. Can you remember what it was called? Something with five? Maybe. Maybe you remembered, but I can't hear you, so who knows? Uh, the answer is iambic pentameter. An example of iambic pentameter is over here. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. What's going on with this line? Well, the first half of the word is iambic. Iambic is a kind of foot which is a pair of syllables together. An iambic foot goes da da. So the line goes da 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 da. And you can see it here. Shall I compare the two a summer's day? The rhythm is very, very regular, right? This is called iambic. Uh, and then the second word here, this tells you how many of these feet there are, right? One, two, three, four, Five. Shall I compare thee to a song? Mistake. Right? Easy. Oh, please say I'm recording the screen. Oh, I am. Good. Sorry. Panic. Right. Um, so, we were talking about iambic before, but iambic poetry is not the only kind of poetry. Um, there's lots of other different kinds of feet you can use, and they completely change the tone and the atmosphere of the poem. So, let me show you some different feet. Uh, iambic, it is the traditional foot of English poetry. If you read Shakespeare, most of the time he's writing in an iambic form. It's da 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 da. It's a walking sound. It sounds very grand, very serious. Um, if you're writing a serious, traditional, formal style of poem, you will choose iambic foot. But maybe you don't want a serious, formal mood or atmosphere in your poem. Maybe. You want something that sounds completely different from iambic poetry. Well, you could try trochaic feet. So iambic foot goes da da, unstressed, stressed. Trochaic foot goes da da, stressed, unstressed. This really changes the mood of your poem. So shall I compare thee to the summer's day? That's iambic. Tiger, tiger, burning brightly. Trochaic starting with a stressed syllable, sounds much more aggressive, much more scary. Uh, we often use trochaic poetry to write about people going mad or people dying. Um, so <clears throat> how to remember which one's iambic and which one's trochaic, which one is normal and which one is crazy? Well, you can think about the word hello. If I say to you in English, hello, or hello, or Hello. This is a normal kind of hello. It's got an unstressed syllable first and then we have the stressed syllable. But on the other hand, if I start my conversation with you by going hello, this sounds very weird and crazy and scary. This is because it starts with a stressed syllable ah, and then it goes soft afterwards. So I am Vic and Trachic. These are both the two, the two foot syllables. You can go Da 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 da, or it can go da 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 da. da. Okay, so <clears throat> you can also have three syllable feet. The two three syllable feet, these are dactylic and anapestic feet. So we'll start with dactylic. Uh, you know, there's a dinosaur called the pterodactyl. What does he look like? The pterodactyl is the one that's got the wings, right? So uh, when the archaeologists found the bones of the pterodactyl, they didn't know it was wings. Actually, it looked like he had some big, long, spooky fingers. So he was called the pterodactyl, which means terrible finger dinosaur. Um, the word dactyl by itself is just the Greek word for finger, dactylos. Um, the dactylic foot, it goes like your finger goes. You see your finger, it goes fat, thin, thin. 
Well, so a dactyl goes da 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 da. When you hear this, maybe you think about a dance, right? A waltz. Da da da. One two three. One two three. One two three. Um, we also use dactylic meter when we talk about horses and attacking and battling. Da 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 da. Sounds like a horse running, right? So a famous poem in dactylic meter is half a league, half a league, half a league onward into the valley of death road the 600. It's about some soldiers who died terribly. Um, so this is this one. It's got three syllables instead of two, so it changes the mood a little bit. Uh, the last one is anapestic. I think this one is the one that has the strongest effect on the mood. The word anapestos, it's Greek, it just means backwards or reversing. So the syllables go da da da, da da da, da da da. So this kind of poetry, it sounds like a question or like you're wondering or like you're dreaming or a little bit lost. What is this? in my house, it's a mouse or a man. It's a dream in my home. Uh, I don't know what to say. So if you want like a dreaming relaxed kind of tone, you can use an meter. So uh, I want you to learn these four words. So to practice them, uh, we're going to do a quick exercise, which is a foot naming exercise. Uh, the exercise is like this. Um, you can see 10 words in English. Uh, I would like you to read each word and try and tell me what kind of foot it is for each word. Uh, for example, the first word here, poetry. How many syllables in poetry? It's three. Um, it goes like this, po a tree. Where's the stressed syllable in poetry? Well, it's the first syllable, right? It's not poetry, it's not poetry. Uh, it's poetry. So this word it goes da, da da da. What's the name of this foot? It's a dactyl. Okay, so the rest I'll let you do by yourself. Please pause the video uh, and come back in a second. I'm not going to go through them one by one. I'm just going to go quickly. So please pause. Right, I believe you. You've paused. Right, here's the answers. Poetry dactyl. Silence, trachea. Let's go, I am. Elephant, dactyl. Music, trachea. Hello, I am. Goodbye, I am. History, dactyl. Insane, I am. Happy, trachea. So if we put these words together, we will make something that sounds a little bit like a poem, right? Ready? Poetry, elephant, history could be a poem, a bit random subject, but there we go. What about silence, music, happy? What about let's go, hello, goodbye, insane? If we get it wrong, if we do like this one, goodbye, insane, happy, the rhythm goes and it doesn't sound like a poem anymore. So this is how to count feet, but Feet are not so easy as just marking the stressed syllable in each word because poetry is not just stressed syllable in each word, but the stress is in the sentence. So when we go back to this iambic pentameter here, we see here a one syllable word. This is the stressed syllable. Here we see summer is divided into two different feet. This is a sum, that's one foot, and musde is the second foot. So when you read the poem, you are looking for not just the individual word stress, but the stress of the whole sentence. So to practice this, uh, I'd like us to look at some song lyrics. Uh, here you go, there's three songs. Um, and for each one, we have to say what kind of foot is in the song lyric. So let me show you how clear it is, right? Uh, this is a song about love. It's called That's Amore. And when we read this song, uh, I would like you, um, I'll read it in each different rhythm. You should tell me which rhythm sounds right, right? Okay, so let's see if this is an iambic poem. When the moon hits your eye, like a big pizza pie, that's amore. 
when the world starts to shine, like you had too much wine, that's a moray. Does that sound right, iambic? It doesn't really sound very natural, no. OK, so let's not do iambic. Let's see if it's trachaic, right? When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie. No way, right? It's not pizza anyway, so that stress is wrong. It can't be trachaic. It sounds crazy. OK, so let's see if it's dactyl then. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. When the world starts to shine like you've had too much wine, that's amore. Mm, not quite. It's not really exactly there, although three syllables sounds a bit better with the linking of the words. OK, let me show you it in Anapest. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. When the world starts to shine like you've had too much wine, that's amore. Oh. It just sounds right, doesn't it? Here, let me play you the song so you can uh, hear what it sounds like in the song. Here we are. Uh, this one. When the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's amore. When the world seems to shine like you've had too much wine, that's some order. Bells are good. It's right, right? Moon, I, big pie. These, these are the stress syllables in the song. Um, there's just one little, little, little thing, and that's here. It goes, that's a more. So here. Da, 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 that's uh, more, that's one. But then you have ray, and then the music goes do, 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 do. Actually, it's cut off the two last syllables of the anapest. So the music can go do, 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 right? So this is something called a catalexis, which is cut the word off. Um, well, we do this in music, obviously, so the instruments can go do 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 do. Uh, but we also do it in poetry. If I want you to read the poetry, da 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 da, da and then have a gap, and then go back to da 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 da, da I do catalexis, um, and it interrupts your reading because it makes the stress go funny, uh, and then it makes the reader pause. So if you want to like shock them or get the weight, then you can do catalexis. Okay, uh, the next two I'd like you to do by yourself so pause the video uh, and then try to tell me what the rhythm is called and then we'll listen to check pause yes okay so let's have the answers first we shall have ABBA from Dancing Queen here we go What a song, yeah? Okay, so here, what's the stress? You, you have time, life. Ooh, yeah, this is the catalexis again. See, watch, watch, dancing queen, right? So this rhythm, it's the dactyl rhythm. Uh, and as for the Beatles, let's listen to this one. Uh, there we go. There we go. Baby says she's mine, you know. She tells me all the time, you know. It's iambic. So uh, we see it very commonly in songs, as you can see. Um, it follows a strict rhythm. This is because English language likes to do this in English. Uh, right, so 
we've got the feet all right. We understand how to describe the feet. Uh, let's work next on how to describe the numbers. Because um, you can see the word penta, like pentagon, pentagram. Uh, this is the Greek word for five. Uh, so we have to count to ten in Greek. Here we go. Here is all the different types of meter. You should tell me what number they belong to. For example, pentameter is five. Can you pause the video and try the exercise? Thank you. Nice. OK, I believe you. Right. Here we go. Monometer, one. Dimeter, two. Trimeter, three. Tetrameter, four. Pentameter, five. Hexameter, six. Heptameter, seven. Octameter, eight. Nonameter, nine. Decameter, ten. So if you have iambic pentameter, it is da 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 if your poem is iambic monometer, oh, da da, da da, da da, sorry, da da, da da. Um, Monotrophs are pretty common, but diameter is pretty common for different poetry. Uh, if we are, okay, iambic diameter, hello, my friends, goodbye, my life, right? That's iambic diameter. But if I want to go for, uh, uh, Dactylic dimeter, it is uh, going to study now, working to do the work. Um, so dactylic dimeter has got six syllables in one line. Iambic dimeter has got four syllables in one line. It doesn't matter how many syllables are in the foot. Uh, it just matters how many feet are in the line. Right. So let's do a little bit of meter practice. Let's see if we can name these meters together. Starting with this one. By the pricking of my thumbs, something wicked this way comes. What's the name of this meter? By the pricking of my thumbs, Catholicism. Something wicked this way comes, Catholicism. So da 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 da. What kind of this is? Hello, hello, hello. It's trochaic. And how many are there? By the pricking of my thumbs. This is tetrameter. Okay. What about this one? If music be the food of love, play on. Ha 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 ha. It's iambic. If mu Zig be the food of love, play on. Five. So, iambic, how many? Pentameter. Got it. Right. Next one, last one. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Do do do, do do do, do do do, do do do. This is da da da, da da da. What's that called? Anapestic. And how many anapests? Four. Anapestic. How many meter? Anapestic tetrameter. I believe that you knew the answer. <laughs> Maybe. Right. So. Final exercise is like this. Uh, it's a little bit of reading for you. Uh, I have here some very, very famous poems in English, uh, and your job is to read through each one and try to match it to the meters down here at the bottom. For example, the first one we'll do together, so I'll show you. See how she leans her cheek upon her hand. Oh, that I were a glove upon that hand that I might touch that cheek. The Shakespeare will give you a clue. This is da 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 da. Hello, hello, hello. This is iambic, and how many iams? One, two, three, four, five. Iambic pentameter. The rest I'd like you to do by yourself, please. Can you pause the video and can you try to match them with the right number? Okay. 
Right, so I believe that you are back. Uh, let's do number two together. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye. It's trochaic. And how many trochaics? Four. Trochaic tetrams. Okay, what about number three? I am out of humanity's reach. I must finish my journey alone. Never hear the sweet music of speech. I start at the sound of my own. So which one is it? Is it I am out of humanity's reach? No, it's the other way. I am out of humanity's reach. This is anapestic. And how many anapests? Three anapestic trimeter. Nice. OK, next one. Double, double, toil and travel, fire, burn, cauldron, bubble. Starts with hello, hello, hello. Right, so this is trochaic. And how many trochaics? There are four. So trochaic tetrameter. What about the next one? Higgledy, piggledy, President Jefferson gave up the ghost on the 4th of July. What's happening? Yes, that's right. It is a dactylic dimeter. There we go. And so our final one. And the raven never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallet buster palace just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of the dream demons that is dreaming. And the lamplight over in streaming, so is a shadow on the floor. This is trochaic octameter. The line is very, very long here. Uh, it's not very common to use something like octameter because to read it out loud is very, very difficult. Uh, right. So we understand now meter. We understand how to count in Greek and say what kind of meter it is. Um, so let's just quickly review the emotions and atmosphere of these poems. When I want a dreamy, confused and wandering tone, I am out of humanity's reach. What kind of foot do I use? Anapestic. If you want a very formal and literary kind of poem, see how she leans her cheek upon her hand, or that I wear a glove upon that hand. It's iambic, right? If you want your writing to sound crazy and silly, Higgledy piggledy, President Jefferson gave up the ghost on the 4th of July. That's a dactyl. And finally, if you want to make your writing sound crazy and aggressive, hello, hello, hello. That's trochaic. Good. Right. So that's the end of our asynchronous lesson. I hope it wasn't too long. Uh, for homework, please. Firstly, your homework is to do the team's quiz. Uh, but secondly, there is an asynchronous task. I would like you to choose one of the meters that we've done today and write two lines of poetry yourself using a strict meter. And then underneath that, tell me which strict meter you have tried to use. So, for example, maybe you want to write in dactylic dimeter. You can say English is very good and I like studying. There you go. That's dactylic dimeter, two lines of it. Um, you can choose whatever one you want. I just want you to show that you understand how to do it. All right, so team square and two lines of poetry. Um, that's all from me. Thank you for your attention and I'll see you next class, which is I think on Friday. OK, so thank you very much. See you later. Bye.